So I really don't think we really need an intro for this just because you've been on the TomCast so many freaking times. <laughs> it's always it, it, it's always great to have you on um, the TomCast, and a lot of people really love uh, when you and I get the opportunity to, I guess, collaborate. So what better way to start off 2021 than have Do Aviation on the TomCast? Yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome to be back. It's, it's, it's great to have you on. It, like I said, we always get into so many... Um, variety of topics Um, so I kind of think the first thing we should kind of just start off with is kind of give um, kind of like an update on our situations and things like that since we like last talked Um, I'll I'll go ahead and start off for me like I was um, I was back at the airport and I was working in airfield maintenance for a little bit so I was getting like a whole new um, perspective of the airport operations just because we had like a lack of travel demand Um, and so I really learned a lot you know, working in there. And on top of that, I've been in pilot ground school. So I've been learning um, a lot of interesting things there, learning, you know, types of air spaces, a lot of, I guess, uh, air traffic controller elements there. And then uh, they sent us back to customer service um, for the, you know, the holiday season. And then eventually they sent us back home because I'm not going to say why, but uh, <laughs> they sent us back home for health reasons. <laughs> okay. um, but yeah, so I've been back at home for a little bit now. Um, so how's your situation changed? Uh, not too terribly much. I'm still in training at my uh, new facility here, and uh, our, we're on a five and five schedule, five days on, five days off. And on my team, my rotation, we actually have four trainees uh, with us, and uh, that makes up a pretty significant uh, I don't know, number, I would say. So we're all trying to get hours in. Uh, you know, there's only a few positions. There's flight data clearance delivery, ground control, uh, local or tower. Um, you know, there's only a few positions available to train on uh so a lot of the times we have like two trainees up there at a time training simultaneously um but so far so good uh yeah i'm just still in training no real updates uh just ready to get uh certified on my first position and move over to local control so i i can't i can't believe i never thought about this question but i've always wondered like which one um i guess since i've been in ground school i've been learning a little bit about this but like which one do you like which position do you typically do the most, like clearance delivery, tower, ground, or mixtures? Uh, it's a mixture. So basically, uh, you go up into the tower cab, and there's a CIC or a controller in charge, and they basically tell you where to go. Uh, so whoever the controller in charge is, a lot of the times it'll be a supervisor uh, who's up there most of the day as the controller in charge. And uh, basically they're responsible for uh, rotating people through, making sure that people uh, you know, get adequate breaks and they get their lunches and everything. Uh, and then if anybody has any uh, non-control things that they need to do, any like uh, retraining courses or something like that, send them downstairs, make sure they do that. So they're kind of responsible for the schedule. And uh, regular controllers can also be the controller in charge, too. I was back at my last facility. Uh, and you just kind of rotate through the positions, make sure, uh, you know, everybody kind of gets on position where they need to go, kind of try to share, you know, positions so one person's not just on ground all day or something like that. And um, it can be a little tricky sometimes figuring out schedules and breaks and, you know, everybody's schedule is staggered. You have people coming in at 7 a.m., 9 a.m., you know, 12 it's like, okay, this person leaves in half an hour. I need somebody to come up and just kind of trying to figure out how everything works. So uh, that's basically how it works uh, for us in the tower. Uh, you just go upstairs, your controller in charge tells you where to go, uh, which makes it pretty easy on our part. <laughs> that's not bad. I mean, you, you, all still have a, you all still have a pretty tough job as it is, but that's cool that you all constantly, you know, move around and refresh yourself so not one person's always doing, you know, tower or clearance delivery or whatever. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. I would uh, personally, my favorite position is uh, local control, what the pilots call tower, you know, mm-hmm. clear land, clear for takeoff, control the runways. That's uh, that's a position I really like. And uh, right now I'm training on ground control. I never really like ground control. So I'm just uh, enduring it until I can get to go over to the next position, which I really like. Uh, I really like working local. It's a lot more fun, you know, Yeah. Uh, people in the air instead of just, you know, taxi via Delta. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, I don't know. I feel like ground's so boring. <laughs> It is. It is. And the funny thing is that at massive facilities, ground is usually like the hardest position. Yeah. Uh, So at O'Hare, Dallas, huge LA, you know, that's the most difficult position. LaGuardia, you can see how backed up LaGuardia can be sometimes. Uh, The ground controller is one of the most important positions because they're kind of figuring out everything on the ground. And if they do a poor job, then everybody in the air gets delayed. 
just because, you know, taxiways get blocked and you can't get people in or out. Um, so ground is an important position, absolutely, but uh, it's not one that I really enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's, 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 a big, uh, it's a big job, in my opinion. Mm. Mm. So I've noticed over on your TikTok, um, I had one of my followers, Aviation Joe, if you're listening to this, he said that we need to get you on the TomCast and kind of talk about your Part 135 um, experiences because I've been seeing um, you've been doing these these things on TikTok called Stitches, mm. where this one person said, you know, like, what's the craziest rich person experience you've ever had? So uh, working in a Part 135 charter company, I'm sure you've had a lot of uh, interesting and uh, wild experiences there. Um, so... I kind of want to talk a little bit about that job. Um, so, like, what 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 kind of got you into that job in the first place, the Part 135 job? Yeah, so I had just graduated college, and uh, I had moved back home, and I was looking – well, I had applied to become a controller before this point while I was still in college. But I graduated college. I was still waiting for the uh, air traffic control application to go through. It takes a while. I moved back home, and uh, I really wanted a job in my field. I didn't want to work at, you know, some – part-time McDonald's gig or whatever. <laughs> like I got a degree. I want to, I want to work in my field. Yeah. Um, so I actually was unemployed for a number of months after I graduated, just cause it was really hard to find, uh, a lot of jobs. Uh, mostly cause I live kind of out in the country. Um, uh, but luckily I found this job opening, uh, in Columbus and, uh, it was a little bit of a drive, but I figured, hey, at least I'm doing something. Uh, <laughs> it was really bored just sitting at home. So, uh, yeah, I went, I applied, I went over, did the interview. Uh, they liked me, I liked them, and uh, I took the job. And basically, how the job was described to me was uh, I'd have a key part in kind of coordinating uh, the activities of a fleet of about 30 private jets. Uh, so, we'd be responsible for uh, flight following during the flight, uh, making sure that everybody you know gets where they need to go safely. We would coordinate with pilots. We'd coordinate with ground crews. We would uh, set up, you know, the hotel arrangements for the pilots once they were done for the night. We would book uh, trips. So I did a lot of sales stuff too, where um, basically how it happened is a, you know, somebody with a lot of money says, "I want to go here on this date," <laughs> and they get an agent to figure that stuff out for them. So the agent sends out emails to a bunch of companies, you know, NetJets, OneSky, all the big charter companies. They're like, hey, I need this kind of plane to go from here to here on this date. Do you have any availability? And we would receive those emails too. And we would just look at our fleet and be like, oh, they want to go from Boca Raton to uh, Teterboro. Perfect. We have somebody in Boca Raton at that date, at that time. They want a Lear 60. It's a Lear 60. Perfect. And we would send them over a quote. Their agent would look at all the quotes and they determine, you know what? I like the company, uh, this company the best. And we would get a contract for it. We would make sure the plane was there at that time, at that date. We would get the customer uh, or the passenger manifest. If they wanted any catering, we'd arrange the catering for them. Uh, basically, we did everything that the customer wanted. That was our job. So catering, uh, hotels, uh, transportation, make sure the plane gets there, all, all that stuff. And uh, it was a really fun job. I really liked it a lot. Uh, it was a good experience, uh, especially a first uh, as a first step into aviation, as a first job. Uh, it was Perfect. Got my uh, feet wet, you know. So how long were you there for? Um, in total? I was there for a little under a year. That's not bad. And, uh, that's when the FAA reached out to me and said, hey, uh, we want you to come to the academy. Hmm. And uh, they offered me a date. I forget what the date was, but it was sometime in like June or July. And I was like, well, I want to put in my two weeks notice because, you know, this company has treated me really well. I really liked working with them. Uh, so I reached back out to the FAA and was like, hey, can I delay my uh, class a little bit? <laughs> And they were like, yeah, sure. Does August work? I was like, yeah. Uh, so I ended up pushing my date back a little bit, which, uh, you know, it, it worked out great. I loved everybody in my class. I ended up passing, so I don't have any regrets. Um, but it's funny because my current trainer at my new facility, he was actually in the class right before me at the academy. Wow. So if I hadn't done that, That's we would have been cool. in the same class together. <laughs> it's just kind of wild. You know, it's a really small community. It, it really is. is. There's only... I don't know, 10 or 12,000 controllers or something. Um, but it is crazy. Everybody knows everybody, it seems like. <laughs> I think that's a common thread in, in aviation, not just for controllers, but like, you know, the whole industry. Like flight attendants know each other, pilots know each other, air traffic mm. controllers know each other, part 135 companies probably know somewhat of each other. 
Yeah, it was funny. Well, I, I told my trainer that I used to work part 135 and he asked me what company and I told him, I asked him what company. I was like, oh yeah, like we, yeah, we worked all the time. <laughs> and he asked me, he's like, do you know Alex? And I was like, yeah, I went to college with him. It was funny. Like we just have all these connections, you know, even though we, you know, grew up in different states yeah. and everything. It just so happened, you know, that's that's how it worked out. So it is really neat, especially, you know, when a lot of people get together for events like uh, Oshkosh or, hmm. or Sun and Fun or something like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, everybody seeing everybody. Uh, if we can do that again. I hope in so. The future, yeah. Post COVID. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's really cool. It is. Aviation is a pretty small community. I'd say you did a bit of everything with the Part 135 company. I mean, that's that that's pretty pretty uh, cool experience to have. Like, you know, booking all these famous rich people on flights to Titoboro or figuring out what aircraft they want to fly on or when do they need to be, you know, at a certain location. Like, I feel like it's a lot of practical business stuff there. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And uh, it's funny because, like, we got a number of clients that, like, you know, you instantly know their name. <laughs> but then there are a ton of them. Most of the flights, you're like, who are these people? It always <laughs> interested me. Like, who are you that you can afford to do this? Uh, it's like, are you the CEO of some company? I just don't know you. <laughs> what are your connections? And uh, you know, a lot of these flights also were, uh, you know, not necessarily paid by the person specifically, but it was like a business expense. So the mm. company paid for it and just flew them. Um, so a lot of people were asking on the TikToks, like, what do these people do for money? And I'm like, yeah, some of them are super rich people, but a lot of them are on business trips, you know. Um, but yeah, it's really cool. And uh, well, Jackson Hole, where you just went, that's a very popular spot. Yes, for, it is. Uh, the FBO there is always busy. It's freaking wild there. Like you, you see these private jets flying everywhere, and especially after New Year's, like man, all these rich people came up for New Year's and flew out by, you know, January second. And man, oh, that the private life. I actually flew. Um, I was in a in the cockpit, and I flew in a King Air. Um, and oh, nice. we took we took a businessman to St. Louis for the day. And uh, I, that was my first time really, I guess, having that private jet experience or p private flight. It wasn't a jet, but, you know, King Air. Um, mm -hmm. I flew, we flew them to St. Louis, stayed in St. Louis for a couple hours and flew them right back for, you know, the day. And it's just like, isn't that such a cool thing about like private charters, how you can get someone to a place for the day to have a business meeting and then they can come back and have dinner at home with their family yeah. that same day. Yeah. It's wild. It's it's a really cool. It's very different from regular uh, commercial aviation, the airlines and everything. Uh, but it's so cool. And the pilots, uh, it's a pretty good gig because basically how it worked at our company, if I'm remembering correct, uh, you basically were on duty for two weeks. So like 14 days where you were working and then you got 10 days off. Um, so it was a pretty awesome schedule. And on those 14 days, you weren't even flying every day. You were only flying if we had a trip for you. Uh, so you could go those 14 days and never get a call from us, uh, and never be called up. You just have to be in, uh, you know, able to work condition. You can't yeah. be, you know, pass out drunk or anything like that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to be sound mind and body. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was a pretty good gig for the pilots. Um, it, it's just a really neat, uh, industry and a different side of aviation. Cause mm -hmm. you know, I went to college and got a, a degree in aeronautics and, uh, you know, we didn't really talk too much about, uh, private aviation part 135 on demand, uh, charter and stuff like that. And, uh, it's just interesting to see. It's a different side for sure. It is. It's a completely different angle. Um, and that, that's what I love about aviation too, is it's so deep. Like you have part 135 and you have cargo operations, airline operations, uh, you know, you have the controller's point of view, the pilot's point of view, a passenger's point of view, a ramp agent's like, I could just keep on going and going of all these different perspectives that we have in aviation that makes it so awesome to work in. Oh, yeah. There's some, I mean, dispatch, seaplanes, agricultural yeah. uh, aircraft, like there's so many helicopters. Uh, it's really cool. Just all the, the variety, I guess, that exists within the field. It is. It's very unique. Um, so I kind of want to get on to a little bit of some more like some of the fun like the fun experiences um <laughs> that you've had with um certain um passengers flying out on the, in the part 135 charter company so what would you say is some of the funniest like rich people um experiences or or some of the most interesting ones that you've had yeah my uh most interesting one uh became my most popular tiktok uh ever it got almost half a million views and like seven uh seventy thousand likes or something like that uh gave my channel a big boost uh totally did not expect it but uh it was about this woman who was in uh miami opalaka area 
and uh, she flew out to Van Nuys, California, which is down near L.A., uh, and it was her and her dog flew from Florida to California, and then while they were in California, we were told that uh, – I kind of mistold the story a little bit in the TikTok because I only had 60 seconds, but we were told that she was sick, and so she needed to go back to Florida, and we were like, oh, absolutely, we'll call the crew out right now and everything – so we got the crew ready, plane there and everything, and uh, only the dog shows up. She had somebody <laughs> drive the dog uh, to the airport, <laughs> and it's like, uh, oh, okay. So we're like, oh, the dog is sick. Okay, we'll take the dog back, uh, you know, assuming she had a vet or something in Florida. Okay, we'll take the dog back. Uh, we fly the dog back, land safe and sound. We, we call up uh, the lady and say, hey, we landed safe and sound. Everything's fine. And uh, she was very appreciative, very grateful. And we found out from talking with her on the phone that the dog wasn't sick. It was just homesick. <laughs> so this lady spent, uh, God, at least $40,000 on this flight uh, to fly a homesick dog. Not even ill. It just missed its home from <laughs> L.A. to Miami. And that blew my freaking mind. It was unreal. Because after the plane landed in Miami, it had to fly back to California empty no passengers uh and wait for her to be done with her business and then it flew her back to Opelika uh so it was just a crazy uh thing it blew my mind uh that somebody is just like spending forty thousand dollars to fly a homesick dog across the country um that's the one that just sticks out the most in my mind and in some of the sick talks I told other ones about people just flying paperwork across the country uh because they forgot a couple that got married down in Mexico, they chartered a plane from uh, Teterboro because they didn't want to do overnight delivery because they needed it that day. Jeez. Um, stuff like that. It's just absolutely ridiculous. And, uh, you know, it really showed me that rich people just live in a different reality, I guess, than most of us. And uh, one thing I learned from working in that business, which I, I just want to say, because there were a lot of comments saying, like, you know, eat the rich and nobody should have this much money and stuff is most of these people were very nice people. It's not like they were evil or malicious. Or greedy. Um, yeah, no, they were they were fine people. And I got to meet some of them and talk with some of them. Um, you know, the people who actually owned the planes that we used, um, I, I got to meet some of them. I talked with them on the phone all the time. They were fine. It's not like they're bad people. Um, it's just, from my experience, I would say that they're used to getting everything their way and they're used to getting it very quickly. So I think a lot of them are impatient. Um, a lot of them obviously don't really have the perspective of you know, people with less money because that's just not their reality. So uh, I don't think, yeah, they're evil in any way. It's just a different reality that they live in, and it causes them to sometimes be impatient. It causes them to sometimes be uh, maybe apathetic. Uh, but it's just a different situation, I would say, instead of like an evil, you know, greedy capitalist or something like that. Um, anyways, that was a long-winded way to say it was a really cool job. No, no, that's a, that's exactly what I wanted you to talk about. Um, I've had some really good experiences with a lot of rich people that are, you know, flying privately. Like I've never had, to my experience so far, I've never had someone that's just been absolutely rude and, and buttholes and, you know, mm. uh, just a jerk yet. Maybe it can happen, um, but in my experiences so far, I've had really nice people um, who are pilots, who are business travelers, tra traveling privately. Like I've had some really great experiences with them, and I do think you're right about the not having patience because they're used to having um, things kind of done in a certain way, in a fast manner, um, so they don't really yeah. know patience quite as well as others, but um, I've, I've had pretty good experiences with them as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, they're fine. And uh, there's some times where, uh, well, and of course, they're not all great. They're human beings. Like yeah. I told one story on TikTok about uh, this one fellow who uh, wanted a flight attendant on the flight, had a bunch of catering and requests. The flight attendant brought everything onto the plane, and then he told her to sit on the lavatory for the whole flight. He didn't want to see her. Uh, <laughs> like, it was kind of rude Jeez. and disrespectful. But also, like, she made 500 bucks to sit on a toilet and play on her phone for a few hours. So it's like, you know, it, it could be worse. You're flying on a private jet, just scrolling on your phone, making money. Um, but, yeah, some of them are, are rude, absolutely. But that's just, you know, people in general. Um, but, yeah, it's really interesting. Mo most have been really good customers. Um, as far as being impatient, for sure. Like, there are times where, like, somebody wants to go into Teterboro, which is, you know, infamous for delays, the whole New York area. 
and we tell them like, hey, we have a call for release time or an edict time, expect departure clearance time. Um, you're going to be delayed for an hour and there's no way we can get around that. And some of them, you know, have an issue with that. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I have a meeting in two hours. I need to be there now. It's like, I'm, you, we can't do it. Like, it's it's impossible. There's so many planes or there are delays. Maybe there was an emergency, uh, weather, you know, whatever it could be. There are a million reasons why there could be delays. Um, but we just can't get you in right now. Uh, and so they would always try, like, well, what if we go into White Plains? What if we go into, you know, this airport, that airport? And uh, that was always just kind of a game we'd have to play. Like, how can we get around these delays? <laughs> Which now, as an air traffic controller, uh, I kind of hate that. <laughs> it's kind of annoying because one thing that a lot of pilots will do, if they want to get into Teterboro, a lot of delays, they'll file for white planes instead, which is you know however many miles away, not too far. And then while they're in the air, uh, they request to uh, reroute into Teterboro. So it's like they got away from the edict time on the ground because they weren't going to Teterboro. Mm -hmm. But once in the air, they're like, hey, actually, we want to uh, divert to Teterboro now. And they try to work their way in once they're already airborne. Uh, oh, I see how that. a lot of delays work is you just hold them on the ground so they're not in you know the sky, obviously causing interference up there. Uh, so then you just got to put them in a holding pattern for a while up there, and then you know if they burn all their fuel, it's like oh well they got to go in now. Uh, so there's some ways that pilots try to get around it, and it's kind of annoying from a controller's perspective. Uh, but from a part 135 perspective, it was nice to try to pull <laughs> around those guidelines, find some loopholes, you know. <laughs> Isn't that interesting how you have like like one point of view from the, the part 135 would be like, oh yeah, that's the way. And then as a controller now with your experiences, you're like, oof, maybe that's that's not the best way to do it. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's just interesting as a controller now, I see like that's not good for the national airspace system as a whole. Yeah. You know, you got more people up there, it's just going to cause more delays. That's mm -hmm. the reason we put the delays in is to try to prevent delays down the road and just reduce the overall mayhem going on at whatever airport. So if uh, people find a way around that and still try to get in, it's like it just makes it worse, you know. Yeah, it, it becomes a mess after a little yeah. bit. <laughs> uh -huh, for sure. So I kind of want to change gears a little bit and, and uh, kind of talk a little bit about football. I know oh, yeah. your favorite team, the Cleveland Browns, have actually made the playoffs. Yes. <laughs> and it feels First weird saying that. <laughs> two, baby. Oh, my God. The, the part that drives me the most crazy – is if we hadn't lost to the New York Jets, like the worst team in the league, <laughs> oh. we somehow lost to them. Yeah. Uh, but then we beat the Steelers the next week. But if we had beaten the Jets, we would have won the division. We would have uh, been above the Steelers and the Ravens. Uh, but we lost to the Jets. Poor like Baker Mayfield. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> They're like 2-14, and 14 and we were one of the two wins they had. It's like, of course the Browns found a way to mess it up. They always find a way. Um, but, yeah, at least they're in the playoffs. My big concern is our first opponent uh, is the Steelers. Oh. And we did beat them this last time, but it was only by two points, mm -hmm. and they didn't start Ben Roethlisberger. They had a couple players out, I think. Uh, it's like all those guys are going to be playing this week. And uh, last time they played, when they were fully healthy, I think the Steelers beat us like 35-7 to 7 or something. It was pretty Jeez. bad earlier in the year. Yeah, so uh, – Fingers crossed, man, but I'm I'm not complaining. It's been, by Brown's standards, the best year in, like, the last two decades. It's unreal. Uh, so I'm not complaining. But it would be nice. It would be beautiful if we could beat the Steelers, even if we get eliminated in the next round. It's like, hey, at least yeah. we beat the Steelers in the playoffs. Yeah, to put them, put them out of the playoffs like that, I think, would be, like, the best. Like, hey, you made the playoffs and you beat the Steelers. Like, I would be happy. That would be, like, a Super Bowl to me, honestly, oh, if yeah. I were a Browns fan. Oh, yeah. Our biggest rival? Absolutely. Yeah. It would be and the thing is, uh, my wife is from Pennsylvania, and she is a Steelers fan. So we are a little bit of a house divided. Oh, I'm no. also an Ohio State fan, yeah. and she's a Penn State fan. So oh. we butt heads sometimes. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, the Browns, I'm, I'm super impressed, especially with uh, Odell Beckham Jr. being out for, like, most of the year. Um, at this point, I think they should just trade him. I, yeah, I don't think you need him. I think I think you're better without him. I, I think so, too. It's, we it feels weird him. saying that. Stop. Mm -hmm. I'm all for that. I don't know where he would go, though. Like, I'm trying to think of any teams that would want him. Whew. I mean, shoot, Tampa Bay's taking any star receiver they can. Mm -hmm. they, I mean, they, they took Antonio Brown. Who I think is, you know, a much harder sell than Odell Beckham Jr. Yeah. 
Um, but I mean, hey, he's a star receiver. He's still good. I don't think he's as good as he used to be. Mm. Um, he's still solid. I, I think a lot of teams would definitely be interested. Uh, and if we can even get, I don't even care, man, an offensive lineman, something, anything for him, I'd be happy. Because uh, I think if we improved our offensive line a little bit, we would be a solid team. I mean, offensive line's pretty good. I mean, you got you all drafted the the rookie in the first round. Um, I forget his name, and then you got Jack Conklin, I believe, from Tennessee Titans. Uh, last season so your offensive line is getting better it's getting better i i always focus on the o-line though it just seems like teams with good o-lines always win so that that's my number one uh priority o-line then the quarterback and then everybody else um so yeah anything we could get for odell i'd be happy yeah i i could see what you're saying i think the defense could do some work too oh yeah yeah our defense needs some (laughs) needs some work uh Baker, I got to say, I'm pretty impressed with Baker. I did not like it when they drafted him originally. I thought Mm. he was just another Johnny Manziel, (laughs) a smaller guy with an attitude. (laughs) And he is that. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) But he's shown a lot of heart. I've been really uh, impressed. He's got a lot of passion. He's got a ton of energy. You Mm. see him running around all the time. Even when he's on the sidelines, he's, like, losing his mind. (laughs) Uh, He's a passionate dude. He is. He's got energy uh and he he's shown it this year and i've been really impressed so um is he a long-term franchise guy i'm still iffy but i i'm content with him for the near future he he uh definitely showed it this year in my opinion yeah i think he's i think this year really he showed himself what he's worth and um he's done he's done a lot better this year than he did last year i think because he's got a good coach he's got a a better o-line he's got a good running game he doesn't have odell uh (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he uh he's getting it together i was gonna say yeah our new coach uh i can never pronounce his last Stefanski. name like Stefanski. Yeah. yeah uh i've been impressed with him i mean he yeah. turned us around from a team that went you know one and 31 over the span of two years <laughs> to ten and six absolutely uh phenomenal uh i'm so glad they got rid of kitchens oh my god uh <laughs> he's terrible yeah uh, so yeah he turned around it's, it's phenomenal and then uh I'm super pumped because on the college side, of course, Ohio State's in mm-hmm. the championship. That's right. Going up head-to-head with Alabama, yeah. which I am nervous about. Uh-huh. But I will say I was much more nervous for Clemson uh, because Clemson, the last like three times we played them, uh, they beat Ohio mm-hmm. State. Uh, they've been the team that we've never been able to beat. You know, When we won the championship back in 2014, we beat Alabama. Yeah. We beat Oregon. Uh, we've been able to beat some pretty good teams. But Clemson always seemed to be – one right step. there yeah. of course trevor lawrence who's phenomenal yeah uh, but somehow man we turned on the jets uh we we beat them bad which was awesome so i'm hoping we can continue that momentum against alabama because i love my buckeyes and i hate alabama man Me i'm too. so tired of them i'm a tennessee volunteers fan so we hate alabama too so uh I also, yeah. the other team <laughs> other team i like is ohio state I've, ne- I've for some reason i've never had anything against ohio state i've always liked them so yeah i'm about to be the biggest brutus fan out there to go for and destroy I, Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, man. Uh, I I have a love hate relationship with Nick Saban because obviously, I mean, he's just owned the NCAA for the last decade. Um, fantastic coach. He seems like a pretty good guy. I don't have anything against him. I just hate him because of his success. Honestly, I'm straight yeah. up a hater. I'll admit it. <laughs> um, but I also like him a lot because, like, you got to respect what he's done. Mm-hmm. And uh, he went to uh, Kent State too, which is where Uh-oh. I went. I kind of like that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, it'll be a showdown. I'm really excited to see. Really nervous, but really excited. I mean, they have the Heisman winner on their team this year. Their quarterback and wide receiver were both finalists. Yeah. Uh, so and and the running have... back, I also believe, was one of them, too. Najee Harris. Oh, he was, like, on yeah. the very bottom. Isn't that crazy? That offense That's is crazy. <laughs> it just shows how good they are. Yeah. It's crazy. So, uh, man, yeah. And then, of course, there's the stuff with uh, COVID going on right now with Ohio State. Um I guess Ohio State has a concern about COVID, and uh, OSU still wants to play, but I guess the NCAA and the Big Ten are trying to push back the game uh, just because of COVID concerns, obviously. Uh, I'm kind of torn about that because a lot of people are saying Ohio State's just trying to, you know, get extra time because they're scared. <laughs> yeah, it's like I don't, I don't think they are. Like Ohio State, they wanted to play Michigan, they wanted to play a lot of the teams yeah. that they had to yeah. back out against this year. You know, they had a shortened season, so. They want to play. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to watch them. I mean, Justin Fields reminds me a lot of Cam Newton, and, and uh, he got, like, this linebacker freaking nailed him 
during that Clemson game, and he just he was down on the ground for a little bit and got back up, and he just kept going. <laughs> Yeah, he he also just like Baker showed a lot of heart. He was getting smacked around in that game. Yeah, and he just kept uh, getting up and coming back, and he had a hell of a game. What was it like six passing touchdowns? Oh or yeah, it was like six it's... passing touchdowns. It was crazy. Yeah. It was a heck of a he, game by him. Mm-hmm, he lit them up, uh, and then on the ground we had a great ground game. So I'm just hoping we can keep it up uh, against Bama, man. It'll be it'll be a shootout. I'm excited. I'm hoping my Panthers get Trevor, uh, not Trevor Lawrence. I go to the Jags, but um. Justin Fields, if my Panthers get Justin Fields, I would be so happy because he reminds me so much of Cam Newton. So That'd be much. a good thing. I would love it. I mean, Teddy Bridgewater's not bad, but like, man, like Justin Fields, like I, I, I just, I, I, I like Justin Fields whenever he's at Georgia. Oh yeah. Um, he, yeah. I thought he was pretty good there, and then when he transferred to Ohio State, I'm like, sweet, even better. Mhm. Absolutely. The. Uh... What what pick do the Panthers have? Do you I know? think we have a course seventh or eighth. Like if we would have lost against um, the Redskins, not the Redskins, the Washington football team, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the football team. If we would have lost against them, I think we would have had like third or fourth pick. So it would have been uh, very very high chances of getting Justin Fields. But I don't I don't think he's gonna drop to us now unless we trade up. I don't think so. Like unless yeah, unless he gets like injured in the Alabama game or something. Yeah. I don't think he'll be around at that point. No. Um there's Trevor Lawrence, he's going immediately. Yeah. yeah. And then I think Justin Fields is gonna be pretty close behind him. Yeah. Uh good luck though. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I really hope so. I mean the Panthers the Panthers need a lot of things. I don't know if it's necessarily quarterback, but um I feel like it'd be a brand new start. Oh yeah. I can say, yeah. I mean, got a new head coach. Uh, I mean, he got Christian McCaffrey, who's mm-hmm. phenomenal when he's healthy. Yeah. Uh, you say Teddy Bridgewater, he's not bad. He, he's no. decent. He's, he's like a fine starter. Yeah. Uh, I think Justin Fields could be better than a starter. I think he could be like a star. So yeah. He'd, he'd be a good pickup. That's that's exactly how I view it as well. Uh, real quick, speaking of the uh, Washington football team, it looks like uh, Cleveland now has the Cleveland baseball team. <laughs> Oh, they drop in the the name as well. They dropped oh, Indians, uh, but they haven't announced what the new name is going to be yet, and I really don't know what it's going to be. Uh, that people have been talking about the Spiders because there used to be a professional team in Cleveland called the Spiders. Uh, I personally would hate that because I hate spiders. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So I don't know. I'm I'm interested to see how it goes. I, I did a little research because I was kind of genuinely curious. Uh, what possible names they might pick. And I found out uh, through my studies that uh, uh, there used to be a baseball team in Cleveland called the Browns also. The bad news is that team played for, like, the United Negro League. Oh. And they, the Cleveland Browns. I was like, oh, my uh, yeah, God. Yeah, we can't have that then. <laughs> so terrible. And I don't even know why they were called the Browns because that was back, like, in the – 20s or something like that in 1920s um yeah the current browns in cleveland the football team are named after uh paul brown who you know brought the team from cincinnati um so i think that brown scene that was just a racist (laughs) yeah it probably was they can't have that anymore (laughs) right that that was terrible that deserves to be canceled right there Uh, (laughs) but i don't know i don't know what uh the former indians are going to be now it's interesting the cleveland baseball team (laughs) Yeah, I, God, that's the one thing, man. I pray they don't do that. Yeah, that would be terrible. Honestly, I don't like the Washington football. That's just, I don't know. It just, it doesn't sound right to me. No, I mean, there's so many. Uh, you're in the nation's capital. There are so many things you could come up with, you know. Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll see what they do. They need to get an actual mascot or name. It's embarrassing. It, it's terrible because I just see the football team. I'm like, which football team? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, God. Has there been like any uh, trends or anything you've been seeing here lately that we haven't talked about that you want to mention? Uh, not really. I, I mentioned uh, in your live stream yesterday about Tesla just shooting Oh, up. yeah. Um, I've been trying to pay more attention uh, to the stock market. Yeah, I've got Robinhood and Webull and a couple of trading apps, and uh, I'm just trying to learn more because it's really interesting but it's also like overwhelming everything with the stock market and and just understanding all the financial uh stuff i understand economics pretty well but as far as the actual nitty-gritty of, of trading and, and investing and all that it's a lot um but yeah tesla is shooting up and 
I forget. I read this article that all the people who were betting against Tesla, I forget how much money they lost. The people who were trying to support <laughs> uh, Tesla, they lost like billions this I last know. year because they yeah. were like, well, it's not going to, you know, it's going to crash eventually. And they just keep proving them wrong. I they know. keep shooting up. They had the stock split um, a couple months ago. And it, and obviously, you know, the price per share went down. And now it's mm. like back up again where it was like before. <laughs> yeah. I, I read this other article that was saying that Tesla, it's worth more than like any other car manufacturer basically in the world. Their, their net worth higher than Ford, GM, you know, any, anybody, uh, which is crazy because they're so like new to the game yeah. relative to so many of these other uh, manufacturers. And uh, it's really interesting uh, to watch. Uh, I've been really interested in Tesla. I would, it would not shock me if they make airplanes eventually. That would be awesome. That'd be really cool. Uh, I would, I would definitely love to invest um, into one of those. I don't know how much it would be. It would be called the Cyber Plane or something. You know, they had the Cyber Truck and the model freaking three and S and X. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't even know how they would make that work. Just the the size of the battery that you would need to generate that much power uh, to fly. I I don't know how that would work. Um, if they want to make like a truly electric plane, I don't know if it's. I'm sure it's possible, but mm -hmm. I'm. I'm a skeptic as of this moment. Uh, it it would be really cool if they could do that. Well, they have the rockets from SpaceX. So that's why I'm like, maybe hmm. they could figure out a way. Yeah. Because Elon, Elon Musk has said that the engines in, in the Teslas are like mini rocket engines. That's why they propel so fast from zero to 60. Oh, yeah. that, my, my big concern is just the difference between a, a you know car and a plane. Yeah. I feel like a plane requires a lot more it does. energy. Uh, especially if you want to go fast. Like, I'm sure they could build something like a Skyhawk for getting <laughs> eight or something. Skyhawk. But, well, but obviously, it's Tesla. You're expecting yeah. something more. Um, so it'll be interesting to to see how that goes. Elon Musk, man, he's he's fascinating. Uh, and Tesla as a whole, uh, their company. I'm really interested to see if they get into uh, space tourism soon. Mm -hmm. uh, like, I think that like could Virgin? Be, yeah, I think yeah. that could be a really interesting uh, whole new field basically not just tourism but you know interstellar tourism <laughs> <laughs> yeah that would be interesting i would love to i'd love to freaking be up in the air like that or go to mars or something like that like i think it's gonna happen i really do think mars is gonna happen in my lifetime in our lifetime i don't know about that i, I think it's gonna happen i don't know if it's gonna happen in our lifetime i mean they've made a ton of progress uh i don't know that'd be interesting i'm curious to see how it works out maybe Maybe in the next 50 years, take a vacation to Mars, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen these, like, little conspiracy theories talking about, like, Elon Musk is really from Mars or something. That's why he's trying to trying to go there. <laughs> trying to get home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, Elon Musk is South African because both of my parents are South African, too. So that's why I always uh, find it kind of fun to hear him talk because I'm like, oh, he talks like my parents. Oh, yeah? Neat, yeah. Uh, a lot of people don't know he's yeah from South Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just an interesting person in general. Really neat. <laughs> I mean, he's got his pros and cons. A lot of people hate him, uh, but yeah. he's just a, like a fascinating figure, you know. Kind of like Trump. A lot of people love him. A lot of people hate him, but yeah. he's just fascinating either way. He, you know? he is interesting. Um, and Elon Musk, he, he yeah, he, he just always finds like new little things to to uh, have stories about. Um, you know, he's moved to Texas now from California. They're moving a lot of the stuff over there. Yeah, I'm not surprised. I was looking at uh, this chart. It was basically talking about, um, it was for real estate investors, and it was showing the population boom and uh, bus around the country. And uh, out of the top 10 cities with the most population growth, five of them were in Texas. It's like San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, Houston, and uh, I forget where else. But uh, they're Texas is booming. It it's is. Really it's a, it's a hot market for real estate, especially and Austin in particular is just like the place to be. Um, yeah, a, a number of companies I've seen leaving California, which doesn't super surprise me. Um, just from a business point of view, not surprising at all. The costs to do anything in California is crazy high. I, I used to live on the West Coast and uh, it's expensive. And I'm back here in the Midwest and it's like, damn, I was really paying like four bucks for gas and here i'm paying like 175 you know oh it's terrible i was in seattle yeah. a, a month ago and it was like like three dollars a gallon i was like what that's, that's ridiculous yeah. <laughs> insane it's crazy and i i think people who were like born and raised on either coast really but especially on the west coast just don't really 
have any idea, you know, in anywhere in California, you know, to buy a house that's going to be crazy expensive. Uh, you know, so you live in a million dollar house in California. It's like you could buy like five houses in Ohio for that, you know, <laughs> like pretty nice ones too. Not, yeah. You know, um, it's crazy. It's crazy. There's a lot of people like uh, when I was in Jackson Hole, I was asking a lot of the locals like where are a lot of people coming from here? And they even said California, Illinois, Florida, Texas. Um, but a common thread I've been seeing even here in Tennessee and in uh, other places is that all these people in like New York and California are like moving out. And they're moving out to like places in the south like Tennessee, Florida, South Carolina, um, other places that you know this whole coronavirus thing is just kind of uh, changing a lot of the rules oh yeah absolutely i mean people working from home is a, a total game changer uh from a business point of view and then uh you can work anywhere at, not in any field i can't work anywhere i have yeah. to go into work. yeah it's funny because i used to think that was like a blessing it's like i can never bring my work home with me like I, I'm done at the end of the day. I just come home and that's it. I'm done with work. Like I can't come home and work on a project or have a presentation due. It's like that's it. Once I'm done, I'm done. And now it's like I can't bring my work home with me. I have to go in even during this, you know, crazy stuff going on. Um, no big complaint, but oh well. But hey, um, you get views of airplanes and runways. What was that? You get views of airplanes and runways unless you're in a um, mm -hmm. uh, what you call the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, which I mean, it, it's cool, but it's also like, man, it'd be nice to not have to drive or, you know, don't deal with snow or True. whatever, just stay at home and my PJs all day, uh, <laughs> but no, <laughs> um, but anyways, yeah, going back to, to California and stuff, it, it's interesting to see just, uh, how people make decisions and decide, you know, to move now that they have the freedom to work remotely. It's like, where do people really want to go? And a lot of people are going to Texas, which I don't blame them. It, <laughs> If it's I got place. to Texas would be a, a really cool place to be. I'd really like to live in any state that just doesn't have an income tax. Oh, like uh, yeah. yeah. I don't think people think of that. Texas has 0% income tax, mm -hmm. which is phenomenal. Um, Tennessee's the same. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. like Tennessee. Tennessee's awesome. I, I like Tennessee a lot. It'd be cool to, to go down there and work at Nashville or something. Um, but yeah, I think that's a big motivating factor, especially just – kind of how the government's handled their lockdowns. I know a lot of people in California were not happy with uh, Governor uh, Newsom. Newsom. Yeah. yeah. And how he's been handling everything. So uh, it's it's just interesting to watch, see how people react, what decisions they make. And uh, I don't know, unprecedented, unprecedented times. They are. They're very, very unique times that we're living in with all the history that's being made right now. Mm-hmm. It's funny to me, everybody who is, you know, saying, you know, goodbye 2020, hello 2021. And it's like, you know, it's a new year, but time is just a construct and uh, <laughs> things are going to change. We're still in <laughs> downs, crazy stuff is still going to happen like yesterday yeah. uh, at the Capitol. Uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> it's not getting any better, folks. <laughs> it's a new year, but same shit. <laughs> my favorites, my favorites when people said uh, COVID's going to be gone in 2021. Like COVID's just gonna disappear. Like we flip the calendar and COVID's just gone. Like, <laughs> right? Exactly. Well, and then there's like this new strain they found over in the UK. Yeah. It's like it's it's getting worse. <laughs> it's not getting better yet. Uh, I don't know. I'm I'm scared to see what's gonna happen uh, as far as COVID and everything. Because, I mean, here in the states we don't have a really good grasp on it. Uh, and then there's this new strain coming out that's supposed to be even more contagious. Like phenomenal. Just what we needed. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's it's interesting for sure. Well, where can, where can these uh, listeners find you on your social media platforms? Yeah, so uh, obviously TikTok, my bread and butter, uh, <laughs> at do aviation, D-O aviation. Uh, also on Instagram at the same handle. Um, I'd appreciate if you guys followed me. And, uh, you know, it, it, uh, yeah, I just really appreciate it. It's awesome to see all the, the love I've been getting, uh, especially from that series I made about Part 135. Uh, a lot of people really enjoyed that. Uh, so it was really cool to see. So I'm hoping I've got like one more story uh, I can think of to share about that topic, uh, and then I'll probably move on to some more stuff. But uh, yeah, I'd appreciate all the follows and, and all the love, guys. Well, our communities are very similar, and we do have some people that are both in each other's community. So um, they definitely show you some love there. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> but I, I appreciate your time today. Thanks for coming back on the TomCast. Oh, absolutely, man. Always, always a lot of fun.